Uh, today is November 10th, 2018. My name is Kate Dawson, and I'm interviewing uh, Mario Diaz for the Voces Oral History Project at the University of Texas at Austin. We're in Austin, Texas. Again, thank you, Mario, for allowing us to interview you today. Happy to be here. Just a reminder, this interview recording will be archived at the Nettie Lee Benson Collection at the UT Austin campus. As we said earlier, if there is anything you don't <coughs> wish to talk about, we respect your wishes. If there are things that you want to talk about, please let us know. We may stop recording if you need to get a drink or use the facilities. Just let us know. How succinct do you want me to be in answering your questions? You can ramble or you can be succinct. It's really, it's a conversation. Think okay. of it as a conversation. Okay. Uh, today we're going to talk about your life in general and more specifically about your experience as a documentary filmmaker. So um, I want to start with the work that you've done. So let's talk... Um, give me an overview first of your history um, working in documentaries, just sort of as an overview so that we're positioned right and then we can be more specific. Um, well, I think maybe the place to start is with college. I went to film school and I think I had designs and I had, I had a goal of becoming a narrative filmmaker uh, ever since I was a kid. Um, and then... Uh, I graduated NYU film, I went out into the real world, and I got myself, after bartending for a little bit, I got myself a job in news. Um, I worked for Televisa, which is a big uh, uh, Mexican broadcast giant, and they had a, a news bureau in New York, and somebody uh, I met at the bar where I was bartending hired me as a, um, as a shooter slash editor. And for about... I think it was seven or eight years of my life after that. I went and shot news every single day of my life. I did two, three stories a day. I shot them. I edited, edited them. Um, you know, I was the guy in charge of sending them. Uh, in those days, you, you know, you had like a satellite window at a certain time. You, um, you pop the tape in, you send your story out. But uh, doing factual, that kind of factual work, doing news, c gathering news, it, it made me uh, develop an appreciation for uh, the inherent drama in real life stuff, right? Uh, and so, and I thought, shit, oh. And I thought, um, I'm pretty good at this, and so I want to continue that. And the lo next logical step was documentary. I didn't really necessarily, uh, it wasn't a direct line to documentary. I, I, because I had that training as an editor, uh, I started getting work as an editor uh, for docs, for TV shows, that kind of stuff. Uh, but in the back of my mind, um, and in reality, I actually still continued to shoot my own work. Um, uh, while I was working in news, and I, uh, I'm jumping a little bit, but I also worked for the Associated Press, uh, I would borrow the equipment on weekends and I'd go out and shoot my, my own stuff. Um, and that led me to just kind of you know, becoming what I am now, which is, I guess, a more established documentary filmmaker. So what, what do you consider to be your first big project, your first, you know, where you really felt like this is, you are playing with the big boys now? I don't know if I ever feel like I'm playing with the big boys. I will say that my break was one of those films that I shot while I was working in news is a film called Bazooka, which is a uh, uh, a one-hour documentary about a, uh, a boxer, Puerto Rican boxer. Um, and it was a film that uh, I did on weekends. I traveled uh, to Puerto Rico, you know, back and forth from uh, Puerto Rico to New York, where I was living at the time. Uh, to do it, it took me about a year to complete. And when I finished it, um, I had the good fortune of getting selected for a uh, Latin American film retrospective or Latin American film, uh, you know, little festival that the Film Society of Lincoln Center puts on every year in New York. And Lincoln Center is pretty prestigious, and I was, I was very excited about it. I made postcards, you know, posters. I, you know, notified everyone. Um, and it was a really good screening. I think there were two uh, showings of the film. And unbeknownst to me, HBO came to one of them. And uh, the day after they saw it, they called me and made me an offer to, to license the film. And so I felt that, 
you know, if my film is on HBO, I had there's, uh, yes, I've accomplished something. <laughs> you know, it made me feel pretty good. So, um, and then, I think Brothers in Exile marked a pretty uh, was an important step. I think in my career, uh, it was a thirty for thirty film, uh, and all that comes with that. There's a certain expectation of quality with those films. There's also great marketing that goes with it. Um, and to be able to do it uh, was really fun. Um, and also we won an Emmy for it. Uh, I was in the, in the process of moving from New York to L.A. Um, I actually completed the film in L.A. And it helped me get, uh, well, that Emmy also gave me, helped me get an agent, it helped me get into the DGA, you know, which are really good things if you want to be a working director uh, in this in this industry. So it set me up for more commercial work. Like I didn't really necessarily, I think it, it became slightly somewhat easier to get other jobs and not to have to worry about funding for, you know, for my films. So you've had uh, Brothers in Exile, you've had uh, Trojan War, about mm -hmm. the USC Trojans, uh, you've had... I know, it's a trip to be at UT. I, yes, I yeah. saw. <laughs> <laughs> I think you spent time here, probably. I did not. You didn't film here at all? No. Um, it's a weird thing with that movie. I basically inherited the film. The film was started without me, and ESPN needed somebody to finish it, and they called me. I did two weeks... Uh, of additional shooting, but I did those in New York, in L.A., um, and I never set foot in UT. Yeah. Oh, no. it's, and it's funny, the film was originally supposed to be both about the USC program and the Longhorns program, like equally, 50-50s down the middle, and I think we present, we, pres we gave the network a cut that um, that had a lot more UT stuff in it. And um, they thought that we were um, kind of splitting the attention too much for the viewer. And they thought it would be better. There was, there was a meteor story with the Trojans at the time. And they asked us to just reduce the amount of stuff that, you know, that we that we put in for UT. Well, and it seemed to me that when you did that, you created <clears throat> this sort of protagonist antagonist, Correct. right? Because you learn more about USA, USC, um, and so you're rooting for them. And, and, right. You know, so is that, that is, might have been a yeah, blessing. No, I think, I think so. I think for sure. Um, I work with this guy named John Dahl at ESPN, and I always really... I worked with a lot of people in this industry whose notes I don't respect. <laughs> I, I just I, I read them and I go, oh God, you know. Um, but he is one of the people who I really truly respect. He has a, a good knack for story structure and narrative structure, and I think that that was a, a good call on his on his part. I think what happens is that if you try to balance it too much, um, you you remove the tension out of the film, and it's a lot of exposition too that you have to do. You have to do so. So, in, in sort of your the array of films in your career, I sense a theme, which is okay. sports. Mm -hmm. So, before digging into that, because you know you you've had uh, you've addressed baseball, rugby, boxing, um, basketball, and, then, and basketball, and then and then you know we've gone into the music arena. I'm interested in knowing if that foundation began in your childhood mm -hmm. in Puerto Rico and, and just talk about that. What, what was life like there and how did sports fit into your life at that point? I think because I come from a small island that, uh, that often feels removed from the rest of the world, sports is our conduit to, uh, it's, it's, it's a way for us to be known, right? in the international arena. So whether it's the Olympics uh, or, or you know, other types of um, sports events, boxing, um, you know, this, this guy is from Puerto Rico. And we're really proud of you know, our homegrown athletes that make it, you know, those that make it to the, to, to the major leagues. I mean, baseball, of course, is huge. Uh, and we've had you know, a number of you know, incredible players uh, who've made a b really big mark. 
um, in um, in baseball in the United States. Uh, similarly with boxing, some basketball players. Um, so anyway, it just it's like a super source of pride for us growing up, and I think you. Um, you grow up kind of worship, worshiping these these guys and these gals, and um, I don't know. I just you know that's just those are the messages I received. You know these these guys are great, and I and I also kind of suffered through <laughs> you know like watching games and seeing these guys lose, uh, you know, lose a fight, lose a game, whatever, and how it felt the the drama of being on the losing end of something when when you know if you consider what's at stake for those guys you know it's it's a country behind them and they let them down uh so it, it it wasn't a conscious choice for me but i think that when when i think about it now i feel like like it's such fertile ground for 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 you know for dramatic stories right and of course it pl it plays out very dramatically in Brothers in Exile. Um, uh, and, yeah, so I don't, I mean, I think, I think that's where it comes from. It wasn't, I also, I, I should say that there was also opportunity for me. That boxer, Wilfredo Gomez, who I made a film about, was a friend of the family. So there was access. Um, and I think that's something, something that's really true in Hollywood specifically, is that once you do a certain something, uh, meaning once you make a sports film, they kind of start seeing you that way. Uh, and I have a story that I can tell you later about uh, how that film led to more opportunities. But yeah, it, just, it, it was just a, an easy path to take, to, to be the sports guy. Uh, so. what, how did sports, <clears throat> did playing sports impact your childhood at all in Puerto Rico? Did you play at all? What would you? What did you do as a kid? When I was when I was young, I played basketball in junior high, and I was a bench player. <laughs> I wasn't very good. I was listen. I you know I, um, I was a I was a bit of an isolator as a kid, uh, and movies were my salvation, and books and short stories. I remember you know as a young kid, like really getting into science fiction and Ray Bradbury, and all that stuff didn't quite connect to, um, I don't know, um, to the outside world very easily. Like I felt like um, I was different. I, I had a feeling that I was different. I, feel, I felt like I had other um, pursuits than, than, you know, island life, hanging out at the beach and drinking and all that stuff. Like it just wasn't me, you know. I, I really wanted to create. I know that from a very early age, I had a very, very fixed goal of being in film. My mother uh, pulled out a photo album recently, and it was a photo album that had, like, pictures, and it had, like, um, you know, a line or two to fill in, like, some thought about what that picture was. And there's a, there's a picture of me as a two-year-old, and the, the caption was, like, what, what do you want to be when I grow up? And it says, movie producer. So I, I find that highly improbable, but, it, it, but, it, but there was evidence that I, as a two-year-old, knew that I wanted to be in film. Um, and then I guess, you know, just to be honest, and I don't really, this is not a big secret or anything, but, um, you know, I, I was very loved. My home was a very loving home, but it was also fraught with... Um, you know, my dad was uh, had some issues with drug uh, uh, addiction, um, so it was sometimes a very uh, like I just didn't understand the adult world, uh, and that's true of people who are um, relatives or you know f uh, family members of of drug addicts or alcoholics. You sort of live in this fog. They try to they try to. Um, um, prevent you from seeing that side of things. So it was easy for me to go and hide and lose myself in the world of ideas and creativity and stories. So, in either in your childhood or 
later in life, you know, I think many filmmakers who go through that in childhood process that through in creative projects. Mm -hmm. Did you find yourself processing your dad's struggles somehow through creative projects or journaling or, or anything? Well, you know, I did later. There's a short film I made called Growing Pains. You know, <laughs> that's like <laughs> the, the, the sort of like inevitable autobiographical thing. I, you know, I did it later. I did it much, much you know, way after film school. Um, and it deals with a child, in this, girl, in this case a girl, a child's uh, realization that her father's being um, unfaithful to her mother. And, uh, you know, there was a similar episode. Um, and it was, I guess, my way of trying to process that it, a little bit. It was just something I wrote that I felt that I that felt true to me, and I didn't censor myself writing it. And so I thought, okay, well, this is honest. I'm just going to put it out there, whatever. And I, and I also wanted to play in the fictional arena just to see, just to get a sense of that a little bit, uh, or in the scripted arena. It's not really entirely fiction. Um, and um, it's okay, you know, I went to some festivals. Um, um, I, I don't think that I particularly learned anything from it that I didn't know already for myself, like about my own history. Uh, I just thought it would, I don't know, I just wanted to put something out there. Maybe in, in fact as a way to, to communicate with my dad. Um, who never said anything about the, I, and I never really had the balls to to be to be like, hey, this is about you, you know. Um, he saw it and he really liked it, and I'm sure he, I'm sure he knows where it's coming from, um, but we never had that conversation. And that's the other thing about growing up in my family. Like again, there was a lot of love, and I felt very loved and supported, but there was never a conversation about anything serious, never. You know, um, the most was, you know, when my dad had to switch, you know, like, like was let go of a job because of his problem or something. It's like, oh, we're moving here or whatever. Um, but I, I never felt like I could go to them for, you know, like, emo like real emotional support if I, you know, if I liked a girl or something and I was excited about it. I wouldn't really go to my parents for that. Um, and I've had conversations with my mom recently about it, that, that it was just, there was just like feelings were, communicating feelings in that way was just not something that, that she was comfortable with because she herself didn't have that relationship with her own parents. Uh, and likewise, my dad was also kind of closed off. He had a very rough, um, very like sort of, you know, man's man kind of dad who gambled and had like, I don't know. Ten wives, something. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, but but my my father does have a lot of half brothers, a lot of half brothers, yeah, who I've met you know throughout the years. So, um, so I think I think movies were always an outlet. Uh, once I latched onto them, I just didn't let go, and for me, um, part of the joy of of making films, even document, you know, document, regardless of how serious the subject matter is, is actually constructing the story. It's so I'm. We talked earlier about, uh, you know, what my goal is. Like, you know, do I want to tell Latino stories only? My goal is really to craft great films. Uh, I'm I'm a, I'm about the craft. Um, and of course, like I said before, there are some stories that I feel more comfortable telling than others, and some that I, you know, that I know better than others. That I feel like I can bring something to. Um, you know, I don't, I don't pretend to know anything about the life of an Iowa farmer. Just not, you know. But I can most certainly tell you, like, bring something to the story of, you know. Um, Roderick Rhodes, the guy in Us Against the World, you know, um, and, and what those kids that he's coaching are going through. The, I think a 
one theme in the at least the sports films mm -hmm. seems to be of course you know the underdog which in every sports story mm. there is an underdog but you really have scrappy underdogs if you remove the usc affluent <laughs> white aspect i mean you're talking about two brothers from cuba mm -hmm. risking everything to come here to become american heroes essentially mm -hmm. so do you connect that also with your story which is you know, a kid who's grown up and and could have really taken some bad turns, and you didn't, you know? I mean, you could have just stayed and been that guy on the beach, and instead you went to film school and you became a filmmaker. So how does that leap happen? I don't, I don't know that I feel uh, a sort of kinship with the characters in my films. I feel, I just feel really good for, like, I feel happy for them, you know? Like, I just, um, I think El Duque is such a good guy. Um, he's really one of the best people I've ever met in my life. He's truly a remarkable human being, really giving, um, uh, he's sentimental like me, though. I will tell you that. I mean, we when we went to we, we had Q and A's for the film. He cried every single time he was on stage. Um, but you know, I also relate. I think it's less about sports than it is about overcoming something, right? Um, I don't necessarily think that I had a lot to overcome. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that like my life was really crappy. Uh, I really want to swear for some reason. <laughs> uh, and then I, you know, I mean, I went to, I went to private school. Um, you know, I had, I had a lot. I mean, my parents were crazy for, for sending me to private school because they couldn't afford it. <laughs> so they were up to their necks in debt. Um, but they wanted the, what was best for me. And so in that sense, I feel like... Um, I do, I do relate more to the experience of um, making it in another, in a foreign country or in another culture. Um, I think maybe because I, I wanted to do this for all my life. You know, I, I, I came to the U.S. when I was 18, and I spoke Spanish most of my life. You know, but I like, I practice it having a good accent. For example, you know, like I wanted to blend in and and to not lose my roots, but to but to fully participate, you know, but to be fully fully in, engaged. Um, and so when I see a Duque story, when I see you know the story of uh, of the Death Row guys, you know, many of them they just they 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 want it. They had the same dream. I mean. Let's not get into you know what people like Shook Knight did to get there, <laughs> but but um, but Snoop and you know what I mean like they they really did, did have this dream of of making it and I think I relate to that to 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 the to, to triumph I guess if I'm being honest. So going back to your childhood, what were those movies? What influenced you from the beginning, and when did you switch to documentaries to watching documentaries? I don't know. When I was a kid, I just watched whatever was on. You know, I I, I think I maybe watched Poltergeist twenty five times. Um, there's something about the music and the eeriness of it, and um, um, I, th I look. I think the, the big awakening for me was Do the Right Thing, and it came in 1989, um, and it was my first year. Uh, outside of Puerto Rico in college. I remember seeing it in downtown New Orleans and I was blown away. I thought it was like the most, the boldest thing I've ever seen. Um, the ending was, is incredibly powerful. Uh, I understood why, you know, Mookie threw the garbage can through the window and, you know, and, it, and everything erupted, you know. Um, uh, I, I just I just thought that kind of political filmmaking was really, really great, and so it made me change. Something switched. It was like, oh, like I don't care about big, you know, big spectacle. I don't, you know, I don't care about 
you know, comedy or drama. Like, I just, I just think it's important to say something and to say it boldly and loudly. Um, and so I, you know, I started just devouring that type of cinema, you know, and I went back uh, and I started, um, God, names fail me now, but uh, I started looking at a lot of black cinema. Um, I started looking at a lot of 70s cinema, American cinema, political cinema, all the president's men, you know, all of Alan, Alan Pakula's stuff really impressed me. And I, and I think that along the way there was just an, a transformation. Um, you know, I was really influenced by uh, certain teachers in college. Um, somebody, uh, one teacher in particular, a Jesuit priest, um, uh, made me read The Powers That Be, David Halberstam book. Uh, it's just a huge tome about the birth of broadcast journalism in America. It's just, it's massive. And I was like... It's just so incredible, like you know, really, really exciting to me. Um, and I just, I don't know, it just, it just kind of clicked for me. Um, then I started working in news, and I felt, and I felt like I, um, like I, I, I can handle the technical aspect of it. I felt confident, and I think that's something that I don't know. I mean, for me, I'll just be honest and say that uh, I, I felt like I could do it, um, and I could do it at a certain level. And maybe I was, I was talking, to my, you know, talking myself into it, you know what I mean? But I kind of approached my work that way, like, I know how to do this. Um, you know, I put in the hours. Malcolm Gladwell talks about this, the, you know, the, the um, proverbial 10,000 hours. You have to put in 10,000 hours to be a master at something. And, uh, and over nine years of working in news, of doing a st story every single day, doing more than one story every single day, sometimes we would have to, we'd have such a small window that I would have to, uh, sh I'd shoot the story, right? Like something happened at the UN, whatever. We go do some interviews, get some B-roll shots, run back to the office, and on, on the drive back, I'd be thinking about how to piece the story together because I only had 10 minutes and I could not make a mistake. So I knew exactly what sound bites, you know, uh, I just did it in my head. And so exercising that muscle really led me to think that I could, you know, that I could put anything together, you know. And so developing that kind of uh, confidence was important. And, and so not, I just, you know, I just continued to work in that field and just, and, and just basically to expand my storytelling from doing a four minute news story to you know, doing 60, 90 minute um, films. So you developed confidence. Um, was that, is that potentially more difficult for a Latino or Latina filmmaker than, than someone else and why? It's a good question. Um, I think because you don't feel like, uh, I, I think it's difficult, f it's more difficult for somebody who comes in from the outside, um, who doesn't, you know, who's not quite, uh, you know, it, you're, you're, you're playing in an arena that you didn't have a say on how the rules were set up, right? And for me, um, uh, you know, I always saw myself as that person coming in from the outside. And, and once I started feeling like I could do it, then I felt less intimidated about it. Uh, and that's important. You know, I, I feel like I had a lot to learn. And I forced myself to, to do as much work as I could to get to that level. Um, and mind you, I mean, this is not just based on doing news stories for a news station. This is me also doing my own work. Um, at the time, um, Avid had come uh, to, uh, into existence, and so I was really focused on learning the Avid and making sure that I knew exactly, you know, how the software worked and everything. So, so yeah, I think I always felt like... 
um, it was going to be really hard for me coming in from the outside uh, and, and play with a big boy, so to speak. Um, but telling myself that I could do it was really the key. Um, and then I stopped being afraid of it. Or, or, or feeling like, you know, I was less than in some way. What does discrimination feel like in the world of a filmmaker, Latino or otherwise? How does that manifest itself? You know, I never really f overtly have felt discriminated against. I'm weird because I, I just had conversations with the other guys who are here, and they, you know, they they are full of stories like that. Um, I feel like um, I had a really, I, you know, I got I I I've been lucky enough to. Um, go for jobs and be, and and at least for me, I perceive that I'm accepted for what, for what I can offer. Right now, that doesn't mean that uh, I'm naive, and you know, like I, I I could imagine that behind my back, you know, somebody saying, "Oh, he's not ready," or "He's not right for this," you know, for reasons that may be entirely due to their own, um, you know, bias. Right. Um, but uh, I don't. I don't necessarily. You know, I, I've I've never had experiences where I feel like, oh God, you know, they really, you know, they gave it to the white guy or they gave it to the other person. Um, now, discrimination is rampant, um, and I think we've made like great strides in the last few years. I mean, I feel like like the industry as a whole is looking at diversity in a different way. Um, and I think that's fantastic. But I just, I've, you know, I just can't sit here and truthfully tell you stories of discrimination because I, I don't feel like I've had them, that, you know, that many. I also would guess that the world that you have chosen to focus on primarily sports is full of stories about underrepresented people who overcome adversity, and that is that is sort of a unique mm -hmm. niche that you have carved out. Mm -hmm. um, so, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I, it sounds like you've smartly. Yeah, like I can't imagine that. I, you know, I, I think if I decided that my my thing was politics, you know, like yeah, I wanted to make films about or so, you know something like that. Like, I think sports is is. Um, is great. It's a great conduit for that because I think that they're, you know, I think people in positions of power can look at those stories and say, okay, well, Mario, being a Puerto Rican, can understand what, you know, this baseball player. In fact, I'll tell you a story. When I first uh, started, wanted to work for ESPN for, for, uh, for 30 for 30, they reached out to me initially. They, um, they put out a call and they wanted Latino filmmakers, um, and which is a weird thing to begin with. Like, anyway, I, I, I can get into that later. Um, so, I presented a, a few. I, f I forget. Like, I just sent a few pitches out, and I didn't get picked for that. And then I then I um, I did another film for ESPN for another for another division of ESPN, uh, which was the Clemente Effect, and they saw that and they called me in. And that's how I ended up um, doing Brothers in Exile. But I completely lost my po the point of that story. <laughs> the, what was the question again? We, uh, we were talking about um, how sports is a good conduit for telling stories of underrepresented people, for better or for worse. And, you know, you were going to tell a story. Yeah, I don't, know, I don't know what the point of it was. I, I had a point. I just, I just completely forgot about it. I think it. we'll end up circling back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I, 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 I think part, I think what I, maybe what I wanted to say was that, uh, or maybe it just strikes me now that is, is interesting, is that um, it's like I said before, once they pig you down as somebody, you continue to be that somebody in their eyes. You can't, like, I, I was approached to make, I was approached because they wanted to fill their quota of, making Latino films, right? So let's say, you know, when 30 for 30 was beginning, they had a slate 
of 30 films, right? Because it was actually, that's why it's called 30 for 30. 30 films about the last 30 years of ESPN's existence. In the first 30, the, of the first 30 films, I believe only two are Latino or one. Fernando Nation, I think, Cruz Angeles did it. Um, and so I, you know, I, I was a filmmaker. I could have done another story. I mean, I, you know, but they, there's a way in which the industry kind of like just classifies you in a certain way. Right, so Latino can only do Latino stories, um, but you know there's other things that I'm interested in. Uh, I'm, I live in New York, or at the time I did. Why can't I do a New York story? Like, what what is it about this this uh, system that continues to uh, uh, just kind of see things in a very very specific way? You know, and that sort of like. You, you can only speak to this. You can only speak to that. Um, so maybe that was the point of, uh, that I was trying to make. Well, I think what's interesting also about your career is you are you know, somebody who's done some really, really um, polished films for ESPN, for HBO, BET. You know, I mean, these are very slick films. So I wonder if you have been drawn ever to the independent side where there are no notes given necessarily from 20 different network execs and you can go and pick your own story or is that just not really feasible at this point in your career? No, it is. I mean, I, I want it to be. I was telling these guys yesterday too that I cannot wait to just do a feature that's independently funded <laughs> and I can take my time with it and I don't have to deal with network notes and I don't have to deal with, um, I don't know, the demands of a commercial project where, uh, I don't know, there's just so many considerations. You know, I try to always sort of follow my own instinct and follow my own, um, like, you know, I, I approach a story, when I look at a story, I go, okay, well, this is what interests me about it. And I protect that one thing, right? Um, I make sure that that comes through, and then I can compromise on the other stuff, because there's always there's always going to be a compromise. So yeah, I would love to. I think what happens is, for, first of all, um, so I'm a sole provider. My wife doesn't work, so I have to keep. I, I in a way I have to keep working. Um, I mean, I can still take some time off because it it really, when it, especially when I do a series, it takes a lot out of me. Uh, Death Row Chronicles was the most intense eight months of my life. I was shooting that thing, and then I had six edits going on simultaneously. Like all the edits have been concurrently. So, so, <laughs> so, and 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 while shooting, so and I continued shooting almost till the end of the edit. It was just like just a lot of stuff to juggle, right? But I, so I take a break. But I, but I also sometimes cannot um, turn down a job because, you know, I have to pay my rent and pay my car uh, and, you know, live. I mean, the thing about documentary filmmaking is that you're still not making big money. I cannot, you know, I'm a DGA member, which helps, you know. Um, but it's still not... The kind of you know you don't get the kind of residuals that that uh, that other people get you know in terms of the scripted world. Um, so I would love to, I would love to. It's just it's just a, a you know sometimes the money consideration. I mean sometimes it's just carving out the time to do it. The the, the, pro, the here's the problem. I for better or worse have become kind of my own entity. Right, I don't have a team that supports me. I'm a work. For, I'm, a, I'm a. I'm a director for hire. So they call me in. I go in. I mean, I call. I call people. But once there's a budget to pay them, and they come in. People I've worked with before that, that I'm comfortable with, etc. And and so that's great. Um, but when I do, when I want to do my own film, and by the way, I have a few ideas that I want to that I want to start working on. 
uh, it's just me. Um, and so maybe I can pull some favors and call people to assist me and whatever and get some support. But essentially, I'm the one who's grant writing. I'm the one who's um, calling and making, you know, uh, calling the subjects and establishing that connection. And um, I'm the one who's trying to get the funding from other sources. And it's just, you know what I mean? Like it just it becomes very time consuming. And I would, lo- I would love nothing more. I also don't love. Um, working for, how can I say this in a diplomatic way? Uh, it's not just the networks and the notes from the networks, but you're also beholden to the production companies that you work for. Some production companies are fantastic. Uh, my ESPN experience is unparalleled. I mean, they are wonderful to work with. They give you all this freedom. They trust me, you know. But other production companies are there to just make a buck. Um, they, you know, they take out a formatted budget from a drawer and they say, go make this thing for this, this amount of money. That's all we got. And good luck. <laughs> and they're not as supportive or, you know what I mean? Or, um, there's other considerations at play. Uh, so, so it's just, just a lot of masters to answer to. So what are the little dream films? What's, what were you thinking? I don't know, now that this is uh, for posterity here, it would be really fun to revisit this in, uh, in a couple of years. Uh, for a long time, I've been trying to get a film off the ground about the lead-up to the Iraq War. When I was uh, working in news, I covered uh, the three months, the very contentious three months uh, before uh, the bombing began at the U.N., the whole Colin Powell presentation, I don't know if anybody remembers this, uh, the weapons inspectors, you know, Hans Blix and Mel Baraday, uh, the, uh, the famous moment when the um, French foreign minister gave an impassioned speech uh, in the uh, Security Council and people clapped, you know, which was unheard of. I was there. I practically slept at the UN because it was so intense. Um, And I was privy, you know, I saw firsthand, like, um, how these nations were trying to prevent the U.S. from going to war. Um, And I also saw how they challenged this, you know, this uh, very shaky evidence that the U.S. presented. Um, Anyway, there was, when we think about that period of time, you know, we kind of think it's, inevitable that the U.S. was going to go and bomb Iraq. But what people don't remember was that there were a lot of uh, diplomats, career diplomats, who were really trying hard to avert uh, that war that ended up, you know, being catastrophic, disastrous in so many ways. So I was always interested in those people, those unsung people from different countries, you know, who were also there day in and day out and had backroom talks and, you know, bilateral, unilateral talks with the U.S. to try to stop it, but to no avail. So back to uh, dramatic narratives, I guess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. War and sports. And yeah. <laughs> Underdogs, you know. There's no, there's no bigger underdog, I feel like, in the world now than a, than a diplomat. Well, actually, that's... A terrible statement. There are many, 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 many people who have it worse. But I just don't think that they are, um, anybody really recognizes what they do. So as a, a filmmaker, this might not be, um, you know, your cup of tea, but the, the power of a, of a documentary filmmaker to make a political statement about what's happening now with immigration, do you see yourself somewhere in that you know, uh, ground where where you're able to make a statement? Yes. I don't like, I particularly don't like things that are too on the nose. Right? I like allegories. (laughs) I like uh, films that um, will make you think about our present world. Uh, And so, yeah, there's a a story, I have another story that I can go into um, that kind of touches on the story of a man who was a hero during 
um, who then became a conspiracy theorist. Um, uh, and so I, I'm really interested in exploring that side of things, going, going on that journey uh, and using him as a conduit to, to understanding why, you know, why people believe so fervently that, you know, that the government manufactured 9-11, et cetera, et cetera. So I do, I do, uh, you know, I, in my private life, I'm very politically minded. It's all I talk about. <laughs> uh, I am active, you know, I, I go to events, I go to marches, I postcard for candidates. Um, and so it's, it's ever present. It's, it's, it's something that's in my mind a lot of the time. Um, but again, it's that, that thing we are talking about before. It's like, I just finished a project. I don't know what's next. I, I, I can begin to nurture these other projects, you know, which I will, by the way, and I am actively doing. Uh, but then something else might come along, and then I'll take that thing, and then this thing gets delayed. And there's usually this, this um, push and pull. I, I just, I, just talking to you right now, I realize I feel like I need more support on this, on the ind independent stuff. Um, uh, and something I need to talk about more with people because I feel like some, I, I personally have a tendency of like keeping my little ideas kind of secret and um, maybe that's not so good. I think sometimes people get excited about things and they want to help you, you know, so it's, it might be good to share. Once they're baked, I don't, you know, you have to get them in, in the right shape before you, you present them to people. Well, I think it's a mindset also that you might be starting to get used to since you're solidifying your, your you know, professional reputation here. And you have that ability to fundraise. So where mm. would this, where would it even start if you said this conspiracy theorist is where I'm going next? I think this could be a, a PBS, which how you haven't been on independent lens, I'm assuming. I know it's sort of the holy grail. So yeah. where, where would you, with the sort of gravitas that you have from ESPN and HBO World, wh what, would, what would be the beginning of this? Well, uh, one route I've tried, and it hasn't, um, is it bear, bared fruit, bore fruit, bore fruit? <laughs> I'll start again. Uh, one thing I've tried, and, and I, don't, I've see, I haven't seen results yet, <laughs> is it bared or bore? I don't know. What? Oh, you, you, you haven't seen results. Okay. Uh, one thing I've tried. Bared fruit, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Bared. One thing I've tried uh, and I haven't seen results is that um, I paired up with a production company to offer me that support for the Iraq War film, and so we're, I'm in that process, sort of early process, early part of the process where, you know, hopefully they'll give me some development money and I'll have time to live. To, to just devote myself to, you know, writing a proposal. Um, actually, one has been written already, so refining that proposal, et cetera. Um, and that's one way to do it. You can kind of um, get, you know, get support from an, a, an entity that has all that infrastructure. Um, and then secondly, yeah, it's, you know, there's just a myriad of grants. And uh, there's a lot of people out there who want to support Latinos in filmmaking. But again, this is not a particularly Latino film. It's just the dude that's behind <laughs> the film is is Puerto Rican, right? I, so I don't know. I don't know how that's going to work. Um, uh, yeah, I don't. I mean, I would love to um, sit down, and I know people who who are really great at this um, and at raising private equity dollars for for films. I just have not explored that. I've just been working. So, to answer your question, you know, maybe all of the above. Uh, I, would love, I would love to do an independent lens um, ITVS film, you know, um, solicit money from Latino Public Broadcasting if they'll have me. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, it's just a matter of maybe trying everything and see what sticks. It's hard to have access to such a powerful weapon like a documentary film and not own the weapon 
And I think that's really <laughs> what it's coming down to is that you mm -hmm. have the ability to make a powerful film you have, mm -hmm. but for something that is not sports or something that it might not be as mainstream, it becomes more difficult. So I, I think that's an interesting challenge that you face. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like Woody Allen and Crimson Misdemeanors, he, you know, remember the movie? He's making this documentary about this scholar, and it's just hours and hours of this, you know, old scholar who's saying such profound things, but it's like, you know, I feel like that's not my bag, uh, and I'm going up, I'm barking up the street. I, I think, you know, I, I've never seen myself as a sports guy. Um, I, I, I only bring up the Woody Allen thing as, as maybe the way other people perceive me or maybe the way I imagine I am perceived. It's, I, I, I've, so I've, I've mentioned it now twice in this interview. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an unfortunate thing that the industry kind of tries to peg you down to one thing. I experienced it as an editor. So um, for a while I was a competition reality editor. I cut, I actually edited 40 something episodes of Ink Master. And, and then everything I got, even before or after, were like competition reality shows. I was, you know, I was good at it and fast, which is also a really good quality to have uh, as an editor in television, you know. Like, but um, just breaking out of that was was hard. I tried for a while, and then I had a stroke of luck. I can tell you the story if you want to hear it. I do. So, um, Bazooka came out in 2003. I think it was on TV in, in, on, on HBO in 2004. Somebody from ESPN saw it, an executive, and he took me to lunch, and he said, I want to work with you. I, I loved your film. I think, I think it's great. Why don't we do something together? I said, man, I would love nothing more. Uh, if you have a, you know, if you have a budget for something, give me a call. Um, I think I agreed to like let him know if I had other ideas, whatever. Um, long story short, we didn't see each other for an additional, for maybe eight years. Um, and in the meantime, I had become an editor. I wasn't directing. That was my way of making a living, just as an, as an editor. Editors are well paid, you know. So, um, but also, I just I, I love documentaries. I devour them. My wife and I go to doc, you know watch two docs a week, um, at least, and um, we go to cinema to watch them. Anyway, I, I wanted to get more involved, and so I started getting involved um, in programming documentaries for film festivals. So I. I was a programmer for the San Diego Latino Film Festival for a number of years. Um, and I also was assisting uh, my friend Carlos Gutierrez, who has an organization in New York called uh, Cinema Tropical, Cinema Tropical, who, and, and his job is really to promote Latin American cinema in the United States. And we uh, together put out a book about, the, you know, it was like uh, a fun little book, uh, the, the, the 100... Um, uh, most uh, prominent Latin American films um, of, of, of the decade. Now, I don't remember if it was 100 or 10. We did a list of 100, but the book was just 10. Anyway, we put this book together uh, about Latin American uh, films, and we had a, an event at the New York Times building, um, and we had all these great filmmakers. Lucrecia Martel was there, and Carlos Regala, and, you know, whatever. It was really fun. And um, somebody thanked me from the stage and said, oh, Mario, you know, you helped, whatever. I got up and people clapped. And the same guy from ESPN was in the audience. And afterwards, I get a call and he said, hey, um, I'm at this event. They thanked the Mario Diaz. Is it you? And I said, yes, it's me. Oh, well, I'm here. Why don't we go and have a drink? So I went and had a drink with him after not seeing him for eight years. And he said, hey man, I really love your work. I just, you know, I really want to work with you. And I said, great, why don't you give me a call when you have a budget and we'll do, so, you know, we'll do something. A year later, 
I am at the CBS building editing an episode of Design Star for HGTV. And the phone rings. And it's this guy, Juan Alfonso, who is one of the greatest people I, I, I know. Uh, Juan Alfonso worked for ESPN International at the time. He's now a big studio executive at ABC. And we had a conversation. They said they wanted to make a film about Roberto, Roberto Clemente. Uh, they wanted, because it was the 40th anniversary of his death, they wanted to commemorate it somehow, and they wanted to find a director for it. They had a budget. And he offered me the job on the spot without meeting me. And that was, I haven't looked back since. I accepted on the spot. I directed the film. That led to 30 for 30. That led to me coming to L.A., getting an agent, getting into the DGA. That led to me getting my first series for um, Red Bull, then doing Death Row Chronicles, now doing this thing called SI True Crime. Just like that. So weird. Well, not so weird. You stayed in the industry. You did quality products. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, what struggles might the Puerto Rican documentary filmmaker have over the Mexican documentary filmmaker or Colombian? Is it is there a well, delineation, or is it all Latino? Depends on what you want to do. What kind of documentary films you want to make. Um, I think uh, my feeling is that there isn't like just at first you know thought that there isn't really a distinction. Um, I think that maybe Puerto Ricans are at a disadvantage because uh, you know we're part of the U.S. The U.S. doesn't have government funding for films in the same way that say. Mexico has Incine, and they have all these other, you know, outlets. Um, we do have ITVS, and we have, you know, private funding, I mean, organizations that are government-funded that kind of provide some assistance. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to answer the question. I don't, I don't think that... that what, what made you ask the question? Let's, let's put it that way. Well, I'm just wondering if there is any sort of... Um not a discrimination, but if there's any sort of a struggle, is it a sort of a universal, unified struggle between all Latino filmmakers, or is there some sort of odd hierarchy of who who is the most established, you know, group who has had the longest history or the most success? I mean, uh, certainly my first exposure to any sort of, you know, dominant um, Latino issues within documentary films from from Mexican films. So, right. so <clears throat> I I don't I don't know if there's any sort of leader in all of this, or is it, you know, as a group. My feeling is that there is better organization in the Mexican community than there is for any other Latino group. Uh, or, you know, other Latino nationalities. I think um, Puerto Ricans in New York uh, are somewhat organized, um, and they certainly made, made films, have, have made films, you know, um, throughout their history in the United States that are important. Um, and I think, gosh, I think it's important for them to have greater dialogue. I think Nalip does a decent job of bringing Latino people together um, under one umbrella. And that, I think that's, that's wonderful. I feel like these opportunities, I mean, to, to do this, to record our experiences, but more importantly, to, to um, get us in the same room is invaluable. Just trading war stories and how much he makes for directing an episode of television versus what I make, I think is also important. I think we should be transparent about certain things like that. Um, you know, how do how do people make it work? How do they juggle the 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 you know the very personal projects uh, with the commercial stuff? How you know how do people navigate that? How do, how do they get the personal projects funded? Um, how long does it take? You know, what have you found works? I think that's also 
all that stuff is really kind of, I think it's, it's essential, but we don't really, there's not enough opportunity to, do, to, to have those conversations. Tell me about Death Row Chronicles, because it seems to be sort of the, which one of these does not belong in the <laughs> film catalog, and I am frankly the most fascinated by it. Right. So tell me how that happened and what the experience, I mean, what was that, all of that like? So I'm, a, I, I'm Puerto Rican. I then moved to New York and lived there for 22 years. And then I moved to uh, L.A. and been there for five now at age 47. I didn't know anything about gangster rap. I, I didn't. I just, you know, I mean, I knew stuff about East Coast rap. Um, but I did not know anything. But I knew it was just fertile ground for great television. And what was really exciting about it for me, when I went to the, uh, the interview, my agent set it up, I went to the interview with the production company, was that they told me that they had the, they had the archives. They basically bought Death Row Records, this company E1, which is Canadian, I think. Uh, so they own the record label, and they own their archives. And so that's a huge opportunity. It's a huge opportunity. Not only can I use the music in the, in the show, uh, but God knows what I'm going to find when I dig in, you know, these, like, videos that they have. So I really wanted to do it, and then I started reading about it, and I devoured all the books that I could find. There are three main books about... Um, Death Row Records, um, each with sort of, you know, v v uh, some better than others. Um, some a little bit, one of them in particular sort of embellishes a lot. And so I needed to find out what was what. Was what. Um, anyway, I got the job, and but, you know, it's like I had to hit the ground running. We had eight months to delivery, and it was six episodes, and they're our episodes. And... Uh, at one point, we amassed about 400 hours of archival alone. And then, then the other part of it was trying to get people to trust us with their story. Because Suge Knight uh, ran the company to... Not only did he ran, run the company to the ground, he didn't pay a lot of people. So when we went up to people and said, hey, do you want to participate in this? Their answer was like, no, and pay me what you owe me. And I, I was like, I, nothing to do with me, you know. It was, that was really, really hard. So, but we, we started making strategic alliances with people who were respected in, in the industry. And some people, the few we could, that we could find who were associated with death row, engineers, people like that, producers, um, who had the ear of the more important people. In the end, um, we didn't get Snoop, and we didn't get Dr. Dre. We got Suge Knight, and we got other people like Corrupt and you know people who were important. Um, but I never really, f I didn't feel like, I mean, it would have been great. Uh, to have Dre and Snoop, but I felt like for for me, the the project was about taking people back to that era and reliving it fully. And one of the things we did, because um, we didn't have any I mean, a lot of money, we invented sort of a visual device. We shot our interviews on a you know a beautiful Alexa HD camera. And a 90s beta cam <laughs> uh, uh, camera that kept breaking down on us. You know, we were recording on, on tape, which is crazy. Um, and we tried to give it that certain, like, like this sort of 90s look. Like we could always use, we shot B-roll on the beta cam. And so whenever we had to bridge from present day to the past, we can kind of use those visuals to kind of get us back there. Um, and I thought that was really fun. We did recreations. Um, 
we closed down three blocks uh, in downtown LA to, to, to redo the Tupac shooting. That was really fun. You know, it was like big toys, big trailers. Uh, so I, I really, it was fun. It was a lot of work. Um, but it was uh, really rewarding. You know, storytelling is such a instinctual thing, I feel like. Um, you know, I've, I've worked in really small formats, the aforementioned four-minute news stories, or in the case of Us Against the World, I was doing episodes that were 10, 11 minutes long. Or you're doing a series, and now you have to think of the overall arc, narrative arc of the series as a whole, what, what you know, what keeps it, what glue, what glue do you use to put it together? And then the individual arc of each episode. And then further, uh, if you want to keep going, you know, each act, um, what devices you use. Like, we, you know, we decided sort of early on that we were going to have Suge uh, tell us from jail, you know, kind of his version of things. Um, he was sort of an unreliable <laughs> narrator, to say the least. Uh, but it was still interesting to check in on what he had to say about things. And it made him a, a, an active participant in the, in the story. And in, any, in any case, we used his voiceover to kind of like pull everything together. Um, and ultimately, it's, you know, it's the, the rise and fall of this very notorious record label that... Um, you know, <laughs> uh, brought in the gang element uh, that had a huge impact uh, in American culture at the time um, that undeniably um, had um, incredible artists, you know, but it's a cautionary tale, the whole thing. It's a cautionary tale. And so we really wanted to render those excesses and make them really big, hit hard, and also... Uh, uh, explain to the audience just how hard the fall was and what led to that fall. What convinced Shug Knight to participate to begin with? Um, so sh I, don't, I don't know exactly. It, the deal happened before I joined. Um, we were dealing with his fiance at the time. Uh, but I, I would venture to say that he likes to be the center of attention <laughs> and that he has a very specific story that he wants to tell that abs absolves him of all wrongdoing and things like that. So that's, that's why. Do you, how do you navigate the entertainment creative aspect of doing a, sh a show and at the same time, you know, are you sort of constantly worried about going overboard because your subjects are here, like in the case of the um, Brothers in Exile and then even Suge Knight? I mean, do you kind of hold your breath before a series airs when it's about someone who's, who's still around? I used to, but... And because that, that is a, that's a great question, because that really, when I used to do reality TV, I was really scared because you have no idea the liberties that producers take once a subject has signed their life away on a, you know, on a piece of paper. They, you know, I've, I've, I've worked on shows where basic facts of people's lives are tweaked for dramatic effect. Um, you know, somebody who has three kids with two different, with, uh, you know, from two different marriages now has one marriage with three kids and, you know, it like, uh, it's just, I don't know, I, I can say more, but um, it's, it's incredible to me. I, uh, I hate that feeling. Um, I also know what, you know, I now know what it's like. You put out a film, you want the person who you're featuring to be a full participant of the process. And the process doesn't end when you stop filming. You know, the process ends years down the road when, you know, 
people have stopped watching the film. <laughs> but there's there's promotion, there's you know screenings and Q and A's and you know media interviews and things like that. So I try to be as honest as possible from the get go. You know, I try to make the person an ally. While it's, it's a really hard thing to navigate, while explaining to them that they have no creative control, um, that I'll take anything they have to say into consideration, um, and and that you know they can't change anything if they don't like that they that they don't like once the film is completed. So I'm really rigorous, and I try to be as honest in the process as possible. I do not try to fudge anything. I don't try to like ramp something up for dramatic effect, which is a, an easy temptation to fall into, um, or an easy trap to fall into. I, I, you know, I just, like if you look at Brothers in Exile, it's a fairly true account of what happened. Uh, I didn't try to make it something that it wasn't. You try to pick stories that are inherently dramatic, so you don't have to, you know, like, ramp it up, like I said, uh, and that have other elements that you play with. You know, Brothers in Exile is a particular um, story about a time when tensions, you know, were tensions between Cuba and the United States, um, you know, were, or relations were pretty, pretty bad, and... Uh, that made his his journey all the more difficult, right? Um, so the context of the story is important to me. Um, I mean, I don't know. I'm rambling. I think, I think, I think that I try to um, to make the person an ally and to make them understand what my position is. That I still have to make an entertain an entertaining piece of. Um, you know, an entertaining film or a compelling film, you know, and that maybe not every single detail is going to be there. Sometimes people are really enamored of their anecdotes and their stories and their, you know, oh, you didn't, you didn't put in that, you know, back in 1955 I was doing this, that, and the other. Hey, you know, I only have 90 minutes. <laughs> I can't do it. So, uh, so just being really, really upfront than having numerous conversations with them. What do you think has been the hardest story you've ever had to tell? The one I just finished, by far. It's a really complicated story. So I just, I just did a pilot. I, I hope it sees the light of day, but it's in the hands of the network now. I just did a pilot. They now choose whether they want to go to series or not. And it's, a, it's, a, it's for a sports... Sorry, it's, it's for a crime and sports anthology. So each, each hour or however long each episode is, it's its own con self-contained story. Crime and sports, right? Um, uh, so we did the story of um, Will Smith, not the actor. There is a Will Smith who was a defensive end for the uh, New Orleans Saints who was gunned down after a... Fender Bender in New Orleans in 2016. And he was shot uh, eight times, seven in the back, right? Pretty clear cut story. It seems like an open and shut case, right? Like, like this guy shot him in the back seven times after a Fender Bender. It's a bit of an overreaction. But it's New Orleans. Uh, it's the South with its, with, its, with its archaic laws. Um, and once you start peeling the layers of the onion of this case, there's so much in it. Um, first of all, Will Smith was three times over the legal limit. Uh, he's reported to be the aggressor in the incident. Louisiana is a... Um, that was my stomach. Uh, Louisiana is a uh, stand your ground state. It's an open carry state. Uh, basically, you give a gun to a person, and you you know, and you you, <laughs> you give them all the freedom in the world to use it. And in this case, uh, the shooter, his name is Cardell Hayes, 
used it. So on the one hand, you have a tragic death, completely avoidable death of a human being who had great standing in society. And then you have the plight of this man who uh, stayed in the scene, um, was arrested. The following day, um, the police department said that they were going to pursue a conviction uh, aggressively, or I think the words they used were to the fullest extent of the law. And this is the police department telling you this. Three days later, is it's revealed that the police department withheld information uh, and evidence. The gun, there was a gun in Will Smith's car that he was going to go get, which then also motivated the shooting. Um, there was the undue influence of the Saints organization. Um, there was uh, uh, the possible um, there was the possible uh, meddling of an ex-police officer at the scene there's all this stuff right it's a, just a complicated story and they only gave us 42 minutes it's a series I would have done a series in a heartbeat also who do you sympathize with? Well, and you have, this is a story you have to, you're forced to tell in broad strokes. You can't, you right. don't have time to get down to Right. It. So how do you stop <clears throat> this from being a wrap-up of, a, of a, you know, an event that happened that was tragic and maybe had some interesting, I mean, how do you shove that in? Well, remember when I said, like, I fall in love with something and, and that's the thing I protect in a story? Um, the thing I, I wanted to protect in the story is it was this is we need to look at the system. And so we looked at the system. We made it about about the system. You can have opinions about whether you think Cardell Hayes is guilty, should be in jail, or whether you think Will Smith was the aggressor and, and Cardell Hayes should not be in jail. Um, but it's undeniable that the, that the system did not ensure a fair process. So and, we sh and we showed it. We showed how. So you're picking a message, like one message, if you're forced to. Okay. Yeah, I am. Yeah. I mean, it's what's most interesting about it. I don't know. Like, I feel like um, we, live it, we, live in a, we live in an, an era where... Most commercial media, um, all they do is present a prize fight. That's all it is. It's sports as news. It's like, here's, here's, here's what this person said about these other people, and this is what this other person said about... And slowly but surely, we're all in that hamster wheel. We've fallen into that, you know, and so we, this is what we do. We, you know, we, we see the other person as the other, right? This is a particularly volatile, sensitive story, the one about Will Smith and Cardell Hayes. You know, it's black-on-black -black violence, you know? Um, I don't want to fall into that at all. Uh, I don't think I'm doing a service to anyone by, like, pointing a finger at one or the other. Uh, I do think that if Cardell Hayes did not have a gun, that night uh, was not allowed to have a gun. Um, uh, none of this would happen. There was no, if there were no guns present, you, what you have is at worst, you know, a really bad brawl between two men and their, you know, respective friends. You don't have a, a senseless murder. So, you said to me earlier that your films you know, are not specifically advocacy films. You're not going to likely run out with a camera to a rally and turn that into a documentary, maybe. <laughs> uh, but you said something interesting, which was that your films are, are sort of, you know, um, draped in shades of black and brown. brown. So you're consciously making a decision. What do you consider your legacy in film might be? Uh, 
I don't know. I, I'm, I'm really reluctant to answering that question, and I think it's because I feel like I'm not even, I'm, I'm just getting started. I'm, I just, I feel like there's much more to go. Like, I, I really am excited about uh, where this might take me. And maybe, like, in 20 years when I'm 67, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll look back and say, well, there's a, you know, th- there are common themes, and, you know, I purposely chose this track. I know now, I can tell you now, that... Um, these stories are important to me because uh, these are the people I'm interested in. I think that as a, as a documentarian, the first thing you need to be is empathetic. You just need to be open. You need to be, you need to um, care about people and about their lives and about their struggles. Um, and... You know, I mean, there's a lot of people uh, with brown and black faces who struggle. Um, You know, I've known them uh, all my life. And I don't know. You know, it's like my great-grandmother spent her entire life working as 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 a maid in you know, a big manor in Puerto Rico. She's, you know, the most nurturing, wonderful black woman you'll ever meet in your life. She's super sweet. She was super sweet and loving and worked her ass off. She just, she was just spent at the end of her life, you know. (laughs) She, she didn't have what you would call glamorous life, you know. Um, and because of my father, uh, what he went through, you know, I saw a lot of people who, or I see still to this day, a lot of people who struggle with drugs and alcohol uh, and how lives are destroyed. And I'm just, I'm more drawn to their stories than I would, you know, I don't know, some other stuff. like. I'm not, th- th- there might be some interesting story about, you know, hedge, hedge fund managers in, in Wall- on Wall Street. I'm not going to do that story. Just not, not for me. And what was your question again? <laughs> your legacy. I think yeah. you answered it. Yeah. What are some of the sacrifices besides, you know, maybe not being able to do every sort of idea that pops in your head that you think would be something really worthy of doing? Are there any personal sacrifices that you've, you've had to make? So I, I, I think about this a lot too because I, I, I want to be I want to be Spike and do, do the right thing. I want to be creatively bold and I sometimes find myself to be somewhat pigeonholed and restricted in the, in the kinds of st- in, the, in how I tell a story. I'm an editor too so I like experimenting. I like starting with the end, with the middle and then going back to the beginning and then Flash forwarding to the end and then landing somewhere, <laughs> somewhere else, uh, entirely. I, I also so you know. Experimentation is important to me, and sometimes you know because of time constraints or, uh, a con- you're working for a conservative network sl- slash production company, you have to do a quote quote unquote by the numbers. Uh, you have to give give a story by the numbers treatment, um, and I want to I, I want to be able to trust my instinct on on on, on certain to make certain creative decisions. I want to be able to sit with them, you know, show them to an audience, see how they react, maybe tweak them, you know, maybe I'm going too far and I need to rein it in or whatever. I think that that the, the greatest sacrifice I make is to myself as a, as an artist is continuing to take commercial work and not really giving myself time to nurture the more creative aspects of my work. 
So I assume that would be a regret because that would be the next question. Would you at this point, <laughs> you know, you're 47, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, is there something that you've passed over that you thought you could take a chance on and, and you didn't because you had to, you know, provide for your family? No, I don't, I'm not, I don't, I don't have those regrets. I feel really good, like, about where I'm, you know, what I've done. Uh, I just want to be able to do um, more challenging work, you know, um, creatively challenging, like artistically challenging, uh, something that moves the needle <clears throat> rather than, I mean, because these jobs are, <laughs> are challenging. Believe me, these jobs are very, very challenging. I just want to be able to do um, the kind of work that I admire from you know in others. I walk, like I said, I watch a lot of documentaries, and there are people doing some some great work, and some people who are letting their scenes play out slowly. You know, sometimes you know docs that are slow slimmer, I, uh, slow simmer. I I I have such I feel so jealous that they have the the time to you know. Let something sort of build slowly, things like that. But I don't, I don't, I don't have any, I don't have any regrets. I mean, I, you know, if I died today, uh, I hope not. Um, I would be super happy. Like I, you know, like I said, I got to close um, downtown LA to, you know, shoot every creation, and I had cranes and, you know, picture cars, and it was really fun. And I've had. You know, I've had the uh, the sort of satisfaction of um, you know reading reviews of my work and feeling validated in that, and that I made the right choices that, that impacted people. Not because it strokes my ego, but because there is something about just doing you know documentary film or film in general. It's just you're communicating something to an audience, right? So you want the audience to get it in the way that you intend it. Similarly, when you sit in an audience and you're watching, you know, you're watching a film of yours with an audience and they react in the, at the right moments, you, know, you feel like you did something right. I love I loved that. I love that, that I've had the opportunity to do that very, very much. Um, I don't know. I have, if I'm being completely honest, I have these like, ideas of... of um, you know, being less commercial and more, more of the type of filmmaker that I like. You know, people like Steve James. You know, who get to do what they love and they do it in their own way. Um, and you know, they go to Cannes every year, and they <laughs> they're at South by. I actually met him here in Austin. Um, the first time I've met him twice. Met him twice. He's one of my heroes. I love that guy. Um, and I feel like, and, and to me, his his career is enviable. Like he doesn't have the same pressures that, or seemingly, I mean, at least from the outside, that I do. Like, which is like, you know, I feel sometimes like a, a bit of a workhorse. Like, do you know, do this. We need it on this date. This is how much you get, and you know, don't stray too far. Right. So in the the sort of puzzle. Mm -hmm. of the teams that you bring in and bring out as you're doing your various films. You said you're alone, but you're not because no. you're married. Yes. So where does your wife, who I think I read as a yoga, instru yoga instructor, where does she, is she bringing you peace in all of this or is this, is this a, a hard journey for her <laughs> to? I would like to describe my home as like a place where I go and there's perfect serenity and it's all zen. And, um, it's not the opposite either, you know, I'm just... Uh, uh, my wife is an avid consumer, lover, you know, passionate, um, enthusiast of film. And she has a very, very um, low tolerance for f fakeness. Um, if a scene doesn't feel authentic, it's crap. And I've sort of adopted that, um, you know, like I, I'm a little bit, I, or I used to be a little bit more like, um, 
more malleable. Like, you know, somebody told me some uh, about uh, some commercial movie. I'd be like, okay, I'll give it a shot. And, oh, I'm excited to see it. And now I kind of see, I look at some commercial films and I go, ugh, you know, like, I, I know I'm being played here. <laughs> like, um, uh, and so we, so she's opened my eyes to a lot of repertory cinema. Between, God, for the last, I've been married to her for 12 years. This really sort of kicked in about five or six years ago where, you know, she's given me an education. I mean, we, at the same time, I mean, she's, she pursues these things. And, you know, um, I go and see Rules of the Game, you know, a Renoir film. Or I go see, she's really into um, giallo films, like uh, B-movies from the 70s from Italy, which I'm not so keen on, you know. But, you know, along the way, we've discovered, you know, great masterpieces. We were on a kick... Um, just recently, we started watching uh, Preston Sturge's films again. I had seen some of them before, whatever. Um, because there's something about those films that even in their, in their sort of commercialness, I mean, Preston Sturge is making commercial films, right? Um, there was something that felt true about the human experience and stuff. I feel like these days... There's a lot of Oscar bait stuff. Just, you know, the, the films that are considered considered to be serious feel manipulative. Cinema seems more manipulative than ever to me, uh, which is why we gravitate towards that or documentary in general. Um, and I am a much more rigorous filmmaker as a result. And maybe, you know, unconsciously, I want to impress her. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. That's sweet. But I also don't want to be <laughs> on the receiving end of her criticism. She can be tough about that stuff. Um, she's also like a health nut, and she's a vegan, and she is a yoga instructor, uh, and she is... Uh, to all, uh, constantly trying to get me to exercise and uh, take, care, be, take better care of myself and I always ignore her <laughs> but she's right yeah I would say that it takes a uh, someone with um, a lot of faith in you for her I'm sure to, to have all of her, her um, her core belief knowing that you're going to be able to make this work and support you because you don't, this isn't full time. I mean, you go from project to project. And I think especially moving someone from New York to L.A. could be difficult. So does she, I mean, is that is that ever difficult? Or does she just say, you know, he's going to do it and go do what you need to do? She's super great about that stuff. Um, I work really long hours. I go away for <laughs> months at a time. I just did, you know. And she totally, she gets it. She totally understands it. Um, I think she, when she comes, when she warns me is when, I, she, it, it, we know each other. Like, I mean, I don't know, we, we live together. She understands when I'm being obsessive and I should let something go or when I'm being too controlling. Uh, and it's a good lesson for me because if, if, if this, uh, aside from empathy, another important element um, for the documentary filmmaker is that they should be, they should delegate. They should find the right people. They should trust that they're going to do the job, do it well. Um, and and I, because I'm an editor, um, I, you know, I used to go into edit rooms as a director and be a little bit too explicit about my instructions. You know what I mean? Like, you know, slide the shot five frames over this way. There's a word for that, which I can't really publicly say. So, um, so there's, I have that tendency. I still, you know, I still do, especially when something isn't quite working. It just dominates my brain. I'm just like day in and day out thinking about, you know, alter alternatives and ways to make it flow better or whatever. Um, so she tries to get me to go for a walk or whatever. 
it was we had a dog, um, and he died. He was like my son, um, and that was a really nice distraction. So um, I've gone through the grieving period now, um, and now we're ready to get another dog. So maybe, maybe that'll get me out of the house a little more. I'm going to ask you one last question, which sort of takes us back to where we began, mm -hmm. which is... Um, Do, is it two hours already? About an hour and 40. An hour and 11. Wow. Isn't amazing? So, um, my question would be, I'm interested in knowing what expectations your parents would have had on you, and would those expectations have fallen in line with the expectations of other families where you were from of their children? I got, I mean, I, I was so lucky that my parents were always really supportive of this, of me becoming a filmmaker. I don't think that they knew <laughs> just how I would accomplish it. Or, I don't know, I don't know. It was just sort of like this, that's what he wants to do, that's what he wants to do, let's not question it, period. Despite the fact that my father, um, who died recently, uh, I talked about that, um, was very controlling about other things. He wanted me to have, you know, he wanted to make sure I put money away for, to buy a house. He, you know, wanted to have grandchildren, which I never gave him. Uh, he wanted to, uh, whatever, you know, he was like, he's always sort of lecturing me on the phone. I hated it for a while, and then I, you know. I learned to love that that was his way of showing love to me. But the filmmaking part of it and pursuing this thing that they had nothing, no concept of, it was so, so foreign to them. You know, my dad was a salesman for all his life in many iterations. My mother was, she worked the same job for 30 years. You know, she was an administrative assistant. She said, I got it into my mind that I was never going to be the boss. So I just was, I just continued to be happy with my job. And, you know, it's, it's not like we, as a family, watched, went to the f movies together. We didn't go to museums and enjoy art together. It was just not, it was just this thing that's Mario's thing and, you know, whatever. God bless him. Uh, I think once I started making films, um, my dad was really proud, and he could see it, you know, because uh, I think he understands, or he knew, he, he knows my work ethic, um, and he was really interested um, before he died. Um, you know, he would just call and ask about all this stuff, and he saw he saw the Clemente effect, uh, and then he didn't see Brothers in Exile. He died right before. Actually, he died the day before we premiered in New York. For Brothers in Exile? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So 2014? Yeah. Um, and, and so I think he felt really proud of me. Um, and I think he understood just you know, from seeing me do it. And, you know, the films that I shot in Puerto Rico, he was around a lot, and he helped me get certain people sometimes. I would ask for favors and stuff. Um, he understood. Um, and I guess to answer your question, I think it's still a little foreign to my mom. She doesn't really, like, fully... I guess understand the process, um, and just will watch stuff. Just you know when it when it comes out, but it's so foreign to. I mean, imagine my mom watching Death Row Chronicles, <laughs> right? For a while, they were watching Ink Master. They got into it, and I don't know. I think it it got old after a while for them. Like, you know, my Puerto Rican parents watching it, uh, a tattoo show. So, yeah, I think also. It just feels very foreign from all the people that I grew up with. Like I, you know, the closest I think I have is a photographer friend. 
Um, it's just it's just weird. I don't know. It 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 just it feels like I had a life down there, and I'm still connected to the island in some ways, right? I mean, all my family still lives down there. My grandmother's 92. My mom, my grandmother. Uh, I have two sisters. They have two, they have two kids each. Sorry, they have one kid each. So I have two. I have two nieces. And I go visit, and you know, and I care about the island. I get a, care about the political process there, uh, and all the stuff that's going on uh, after the hurricane, all that stuff. But I also feel like my life here is a completely different life, and I'm engaged in the political process here. Um, uh, it's just two. It's just two worlds. It's, it's it's weird. I live in two worlds, and I want to bridge that. I, I do often, very, very often, think about going back to Puerto Rico and making films there. Because I, I did for a while. I mean, I started, you know, I don't know, if you'll see, I listed the movies before Bazooka were a bunch of films that I made um, for Puerto Rican television that I also did on my spare time. And they were very local things, you know. Uh... And I, I, do, I, don't, I don't like that uh, sort of disjointed feeling. I, 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 you know, I want to integrate it, um, and I haven't really had the opportunity to do so. And I think maybe a project will do that, or a few. Was there anything that I didn't ask you, some brilliant nugget that we didn't cover? No, but let me, hold on. I don't think so. I need chapstick. <laughs> um, you know anything? It's so weird talking about your life. I don't think about my life all that much. Um, no, I don't. I don't. I can't think of anything. Thank you. Thank you for being patient. Thank you for yeah. joining us. We appreciate it, and for kind of opening up, you know, your life about all this stuff. It's not easy to talk about, but I think it really. Helps people understand filmmaking and the importance. Okay, thank you. Thank you.